afternoon and welcome to the faculty forum on ebooks. This forum is being presented by the Office of the Provost, the Cheng Library, Instruction and Research Technology, and the Technology Across the Curriculum Committee. I'm Loretta McLaughlin Vignet. I'm an assistant professor in the Communication Department and chair of the TAC Committee. Welcome and thank you for taking time to come today. When the TAC committee was first <coughs> approached about participating in this forum, I thought to myself, oh yes, I, I know what an ebook is. It's, it's all that stuff I can read on my tablet or my computer. But as our committee started talking about what each individual knew to be an ebook, we realized that there was a lot of confusion, some overlap, and some missing pieces for nearly every member of the committee. So not everyone's understanding of what an ebook is is the same and we thought we needed to address that. So the purpose of this forum is to help clarify the term ebook. And a little bit of internet research showed that there really isn't even a standard definition for ebook. Um, there are some people who think that the term ebook shouldn't even be a real term because what is a book? A book is filled with pages and print and is tactile. There's no such thing as an ebook because an ebook doesn't meet those qualities of a definition. But that's not what this forum is going to address. We're going to talk a little bit more about delivery systems. So what is an ebook, and why should faculty be aware of them? Today we're going to provide some general information to help faculty understand the landscape of ebooks. What are e-consumer materials? What are e-academic titles? What are e-textbooks? Our program today will begin with the consumer market and librarian Mark Sanford will give you an overview of this area. Next, we'll have Richard Carney, also of the library, who will review e-academic titles explaining what they are and give an overview of collections that are available to our William Patterson community. He will also discuss the important features you should know about, as well as the costs and pros and cons of using them. Next, Professor Bella Florenthal will explain e-textbooks, should you offer your students the option of using an e-textbook in your course? What are the pros and cons of using e-textbooks? Professor Florenthal will also touch upon the major publishers that you should be aware of, as well as important features of e-textbooks. And as part of this forum section, we'll try to answer the burning question, will allowing students to use an electronic version of the textbook save them money on the cost of the textbook? Sokol Mato and Scott Dunlop of the bookstore will provide information about e-textbook options that are available to you and how to get pricing information. This forum is for you, the faculty. We want you to have an opportunity to ask questions and to get feedback. So the final portion of today's program will include time to do just that. Ann Silberti and Sandy Miller, as well as our presenters and Donna Pataco, are here to answer your questions. And if we should run out of time and you think of a question after the forum's completion, or you have remaining questions or suggestions or an evaluation of the program, we'll give you some information about how to get that to us. So without further ado, let us begin with Mark Sanford. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be brief. Uh, I'm talking, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the consumer model. Uh, I like delivery systems, uh, uh, the term that Loretta used, but uh, I, I think it also helps to view ebooks and your options <coughs> as various models because what, what the various presenters, uh, presenters <coughs> will be giving you, it's still, it's still a book. It's got usually pages, usually. I would argue it's a book. <laughs> Uh, but uh, as a faculty member who's looking to incorporate these either into your own uh, personal research, day-to-day -day life, or to the classroom, uh, we really have to understand the model through which the vendors give us access to these, to these titles uh, in, under, in able to, order, uh, to understand how we can get them, why we should use them, uh, and what the limits may be. So the consumer model is I brought my Nook. So you may have a Kindle, you may have a Nook, you may not have any. Uh, that's, uh, that's the kind of model that I'm looking at, okay? So uh, the consumer model I define as marketing to an individual user. And that's again, Amazon's Kindle, Barnes & Noble's Nook. Uh, Google now has a, uh, a, a reader agnostic 
model where they provide ebooks and you can download them onto whatever device or your computer or your laptop, iPad, whatever. Uh, but that their model is set up to sell one copy to one person. Okay, uh, so. When we look at the other options that we have that Richard and the bookstore will be talking about, uh, that changes things. For instance, as a librarian, people say, well, can you get these books for us? Uh, and you know, your public library will probably have some, uh, some mechanism that you can download ebooks for a limited time. Uh, that's very different than some of the, the packages that Richard will be talking about that we can provide access to on a broader scale. The, the biggest difference is when your library provides access to you, while you're reading it, no one else can. Which, uh, when we think ebooks, we think, oh, it's great, anyone can use it, it's just a file, it's not a physical thing that gets passed around. Well, the publishers want to make their money, and they get around that by saying, we kind of make it like one thing that gets passed around, except instead of the file, it's the, the license or the permission to use it. Okay, so uh, I think that's, uh, that's a foundation that we have to realize when we start looking at various models. If we want to meet the need in a classroom for many students, is this something that each student is going to have to get on their own, as if it was they each own a Kindle or they each own a Nook, and they have to go to Amazon, click buy this, and download it to their, uh, you know, to their personal reader, or is there some other way of looking at it? Is there some way, other way of accessing it? And that depends, again, on the model. So that's just the context that I think is, an, is important to have. <clears throat> um, to clarify, both Kindle and Barnes and Noble, Amazon and Barnes and Noble allow you to lend books. Uh, so if I have a, a book, some of them, participating titles, can be lent usually a single time. So if I've read this on my reader, I can set up an account and I can let, uh, I can let Bella read it on her reader, but that's it then. It's cut off. Now I can't lend that anymore. So again, a very different model than a paperback or a hardcover where you know, I get it back and I give it to someone else. Uh, and you know, it's the vendors protecting themselves, and that's understandable. But uh, again, it's context. Okay? So I'm probably even ahead of time, but I don't want to take time from anyone else. Uh, if you have questions about consumer readers or what they can do, uh, you can use an iPad, you can use a Fire. There's plenty of ways to read them. I'm happy to uh, answer questions, but I don't want to talk too much about them now because uh, right now I think this is more uh, probably what we're not looking for in this environment. It's the other models that are useful to us as educators and to providing options to students, uh, with some exceptions. You know, you can get uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and you can have the students download that and that's fantastic. But for most of us in, in non, um, uh, the non-classics or the non-literary fields, uh, those models simply don't exist for the books that we want to offer or for the resources we want to offer our students uh, or ourselves, quite possibly. Okay, so I will turn it over again. Um, to Richard. Is that going to clash with the... Yeah, I just want to get that status back. I will. Okay. Hooray! <laughs> All right. Let's see if I can get this to come up. I'll just go to this for now. All right, so, friends, what we're calling... Uh, for my segment, e-academic titles, uh, for the purpose of this session are um, traditional monographs and related uh, titles published by university presses, the uh, commercial trade and academic publishers, essentially the titles that make up the, the bulk of the library's uh, current print collection. And we're distinguishing these um, from the market that uh, Mark described, the mass market publications, those sorts of things, and those titles that are specifically produced as textbooks. Um, for classroom use, and of course you're going to hear more of that shortly. Now both of these other spheres of the book world, um, they have their own business models and their own assumptions about their markets and they differ from what we see with um, academic titles. I point this out because we understand um, that in practice faculty may want to use a textbook, an academic monograph, or a mass market publication all in the same course. It's very easy uh, to envision that happening. Um, and you may wonder why it is, then, in practice, why different sorts of rules apply in each case. And for right now, they do, and I think they probably will for a while. Now, as, as has already been the case with our um, old print indexes and our journals, these publications, these books, are now migrating um, pretty rapidly to electronic formats in a major way. 
although we expect that their paper counterparts are going to continue to be produced for quite some time. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to be operating on the assumption that the primary use, your primary use, of our, our e-academic titles uh, will be as assigned texts, so either chapters or subsections of a book, or as resources for student and faculty research, you know, for project work. Now, to date, the Chang Library has invested in electronic books primarily through two substantial collections. Right? About 10 years ago, we purchased a few large collections from a company called Net Library, which was one of the first companies to produce a web platform for the hosting and distribution of academic monographs. We, put, we bought about 4,500 titles in all, and Net Library was subsequently pr purchased by EBSCO, which is one of the largest electronic publishing uh, companies in the higher education sector. And the platform's been rebranded as um, eBooks on EBSCO Host. These are titles that we own. We, we bought them, we own them, we will continue to own them. Now in January, um, we began a subscription to a very large uh, leased collection of academic titles from a company called eBrary, which is a subsidiary of a company called ProQuest, another very large electronic publishing company in the higher education sector. And this collection, which is called Academic Complete, contains over 72,000 titles, uh, with a very good distribution of titles relevant to every discipline uh, that's taught in the university. Over 85% of the titles in Academic Complete were published since the year 2000. And although there's some duplication of titles we already owned in print, for the most part, uh, the collection represents an enhancement. It's an augmentation of our existing collection for those years. In addition to these collections, uh, we've also added to our catalog some free titles from the National Academies Press, classics in the public domain, uh, available from sort of long-standing ebook repositories like Project Gutenberg, some additional one-off purchases. Together, all of these electronic book titles, roughly 77,000 now, they represent about 20% of the Chang Library's entire book collection. So that, that's a big leap. Right, just since January. And there are, of course, many other academic book publishers that make their titles and collections available for sale or lease. In the current phase of our exploration into ebooks, though, what we want is to determine um, faculty and student comfort with the format. And we think the easiest way to do that right now is to keep things relatively simple, right? which means that only two major platforms for ebook use uh, with a lot of similarities between them. Right, so, how do you use ebooks? We regard your main access point for uh, electronic books to be the Cheng catalog, our library catalog. Uh, however, you could search through both collections through their own portals or interfaces. But we catalog all the records that we receive. Right? And um, I'm going to kind of you know, force a search to get an ebook. Okay, and so we have an example here. Ebooks are will be um, evident because they, for one thing, they always have electronic resource in the title, and they're always indicated as being an internet resource. It can be a little confusing th sometimes because their old print world call number is still present there, but there is a uh, click here for full text link. And this will take you into the electronic book. Now, inside, once you're inside the uh, book environment, which you can view through this, this screen, or through software that you can download onto your own machine, which has some additional features, it's certainly possible to navigate the book and read it entirely online. You can give yourself more space by um, reducing this little uh, screen here and increasing the resolution. So I can blow this up to say, you know, 200%, something like that, and move through it. And you can also search within the, within the book. So if I'm looking for something like capitalism, and I get these probabilistic results about the frequency of the terms that come up. Um, now, a great benefit for ebooks, regardless of whether you're using eBrary or EBSCO, is that um, you, should, you should and can have a personal account 
because that allows you to do certain things with a electronic book that you are familiar with and probably like to do with a print book. So that includes things like highlighting and making notes. Just to give you a quick look at that, because time is limited, I'm going to go to my bookshelf, which is another uh, thing that you get with a personal account, and go to a place where I made a note and highlighted text in a book that I have. Right? These are features that are included in eBrary. All right. um, the reader software that is provided works very well on uh, ordinary workstations. We've tested these things already. Uh, but wait, there's more. You can also download uh, materials from eBrary and from EBSCO's eBooks. You do need to have a personal account for that, but once you have one, you can do it. If you go to download, you have some options. Right. Typically, um, what you're able to do is to download an entire chapter of a book as a standalone PDF that's yours to keep, or somewhere up to about 60 pages of text. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Selected, uh, you know, wherever you like. And if you want to, you also have the option to download the entire book. Uh, the loan period is set by the publisher in all cases. In this case, this is a seven day loan. You do need to have some technology. You have to have Adobe Digital Editions, which is a protector of digital rights management, this bundle of rights <laughs> that gets attached uh, to protect the publishers and to govern the use that's licensed of the book. But you can put that onto an electronic reader. Um, Mark had mentioned before that if you um, download books, particularly I think in the mass market world, or I think he alluded to the library as well, that um, if someone downloads a book or is using a book exclusively, that other people are denied access to it. Well, sometimes. Uh, in, the, in this case, for example, I tested this. I have downloaded an eBrary book about um, the uh, Haymarket massacres, as I had titled that's in our eBrary collection, onto an iPad. So I downloaded it using eBrary's function. However, I tested this. It is still the case that anyone can have access to eBrary on eBrary's platform on this book. So. You can still have it. Um, for a lot of what we get through our collections, we have simultaneous usage. So that is possible. And we want you to use these things. Um, now, as far as the uh, costs and models, just want to mention that briefly. Uh, the business models and resulting costs for ebooks, they vary a great deal. Uh, I think we're still very much at the early stages here in terms of the relationships between libraries and publishers and other vendors, other players in the ebook market. There have been, for example, I'll just mention probably four of the, the most common types of models. There's a premium markup per title. Right? So if I wanted to buy one book in electronic format, a monograph in electronic format, I might have to pay something like 150% of the print title cost because of the convenience of being able to access it online. Um, in some cases, though, publishers are moving their electronic prices closer to print prices. There's a recent trend. There can be a variation on that cost for uh, purchase titles if there are simultaneous user licenses. Right? That's an add-on cost. If a book is going to be in high demand, we will do that. You can get discounts on purchase collections from publishers. We have a number of offers on the table for that. And you can also get discounts on subscription and lease collections for what we're paying for Academic Complete. I believe the cost is um, it's pennies on the dollar at this point. Now there are definite pros and cons to uh, eBooks right now, and we very much are interested in your feedback about this. We think there are some clear advantages. They are, of course, accessible anytime, anywhere, with a network connection. Uh, there's full text indexing. That trumps tables of contents and backs of the book. You can find terms anywhere. Uh, they are portable on these devices. Of course, you could say the same things about print books. There are some technical pluses. You know, you can do things like zoom in to increase print size. Um, eBury provides software which you can download onto your own machine that gives you text-to-voice technology and e-reader software, so it can turn any e-book into an audio book. There are some cons, though. Um, technology issues, I think, still present a practical barrier to use. It is true there are different platforms, there are different technical requirements, there are different e-readers. This can be frustrating to people, and we understand that. That's being worked out. Uh, there are all, a host of back-end intellectual property licensing issues. Um, this is still being thrashed out. It's going to continue for a while. It doesn't mean much to users, of course, 
until they come up against the barriers. But please know that libraries are working very hard to ensure that the principles and practices of fair use that we have worked out over many decades uh, are not going to be sacrificed just because of the transition to the electronic world. And I think maybe most important, we're not certain yet if the culture has shifted. Um, I'm going to say this on the basis of my own experience as a reference librarian. Just this week I spoke to a number of students uh, and I, I'm still not finding that enthusiasm yet when uh, I, I informed them that a title in the catalog is available in electronic format. I, you know, I actually had somebody, a student, tell me, I really want to hold it in my hand. <laughs> and you know, you know you've got an issue when, when, somebody, um, when you inform somebody that a book is electronic, that the first thing they say to you is, can I print it all out? <laughs> So, um, you know, and, and yet this doesn't exist when it comes to journal articles and databases and other such things. So maybe we're just in a period of transition. Maybe you are too. Um, so these are things that we want uh, you to know, to, we want to know from you. And uh, you should consider the library to be your frontline support for this. But we want to encourage you uh, to make use of these e-academic e titles know that they're available in the catalog, that you can use them, that the students can use them, and we want to work with you uh, in coming up with the creative ways to use them in the classroom and beyond. All right, so let us know. And now we shall continue. Just while, while uh, Bella is switching, yes. it's occurred to me that uh, one of the things that we didn't say, uh, that Mark could have said and Richard could have said, is one of the principles of, of the print world is or used to be, I guess it still is, is the, is the principle of the right of first sale. If I buy a book for $39.95, I own it and I can do anything I want with it. For research purposes, I can copy it, uh, I can loan it, I can read it as many times as I want, I can give it to Kurt to read as many times as he wants, he can give it to Victoria to read as many times as, I want, as she wants. And we're finding that this right of first sale is is being compromised obviously in the, in the e-world um, by publishers uh, and distributors who need to make more money than allowing you to pay for it once they want you to pay for it again and again and in the uh, e-academic titles that the 70,000 that we've gotten from from ebrary we're actually leasing them for a year we didn't buy them we're, we're paying a subscription. We wanted to get a lot of them for, as Richard said, pennies on the dollar to see how they were used, what people will use, what some groups of people want to use what. So this, this, the economics of this is just terribly fascinating. And Bella will talk more about it from the e textbook side. OK, so um, if you don't know me, my name is Bella Florental, and I'm with the College of Business. I'm a marketing professor. And I started to look into the e-textbooks also in my classes. I teach about it a little bit. It's a nice case to talk about in, in terms of marketing. And also I experimented with few of them. So I'll give you, it will not be a very broad perspective because I uh, have my own experience. But I'll give you a few options. I'll give you a few things that you can look into if you are interested. So what I want to talk today is basically give you a very, very small background about the <coughs> e-textbook market, why everybody wants to be in that space. Um, the second thing I want to do is I want to show you some, um, I want to talk about some strengths and weaknesses of some of the things I experimented with. One of them is Core Smart. Uh, another one is Inkling. Uh, how many people heard about Inkling? Nobody? Good. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, McGraw Hill Connect, which I use for my class. I teach marketing management class, and I use it, and I want to talk about the e textbook they are offering. So uh, let me talk first about Core Smart. Uh, let me first talk about the e-textbook uh, e market. If you see it, the first thing is that the textbook market is huge, $4.5 billion in 2010. So that's a big uh, place or a big market that e-books can start to build themselves if they start to take market share from the regular books. You also can see that recently college students started to acquire 
uh, tablets. So you have a huge jump in number of tablets that college students are owning. So there is another opportunity here. So the third thing is, uh, okay, so what are we have currently? Currently we have a very small percentage of e-textbooks that people uh, purchase or own or use, but you see already that uh, it's predicted that they will go up significantly. So we are going there. Maybe it takes time for people to get used to that. And at first, I had uh, my issues to try to use either the textbook, the, the physical book, or use the e-textbook that is offered. But uh, I'll have to, I have to tell you that now I don't open the textbook. I only go online and check everything. So I got used to it. So it takes time. But once you start to do it, you see that there are some uh, benefits to it. Let me talk about the course smart. The model is a rental model. Many, how many people know about course smart? Okay, so I'll, I'll uh, go over what, what are the strengths. CourseSmart is, interestingly enough, was one of the first to uh, enter this e-textbook market. That's why they have such a huge uh, number of titles that they can offer. They work in almost with every publisher of textbooks. But um, I said to my publisher recently, I think they got a little bit stuck. Uh, they are not seeing where this market is going, and, and, and they are losing right now their strength. Um, um, you see that they are offering about 50% uh, of the value of if you, if you buy a print book, so you are basically saving 50%. They are also did a very nice thing that you can have an iPhone and an iPad app, so you can actually use it via mobile devices, um, and they are free. The nice thing about the iPad is that you can take notes, you can um, highlight some things, and you can also, um, you have a ruler that usually works. I figured it out. Mm -hmm. I don't use it so much. But um, it's, it's a nice thing that you can actually move while you are reading with a ruler. Uh, I'll show, I'll demonstrate it quickly in a second. The weakness is, of course, it's a rent, so you never recoup your money, whatever you invested, it's for a short period of time. So if you took notes and if you want to keep the textbook, so uh, you, you cannot do that, it all goes away. Um, it's not very scalable, and I'll show you what I mean with the iPad. Um, the search option in the iPad is very limited. You can go by uh, page number, not so much by the term. Uh, and also, the iPhone app is very, very limited. And finally, sorry, <laughs> I need to go back. Okay. Um, and finally, um, what we can also see, uh, you have to work online. It doesn't work offline. So that's another thing. Um, so let me show you quickly how it looks if some of you didn't see it on the iPad. So I'm going to show you. The first thing you see is that it already uh, is more manageable in this form. So if you want to tilt it, um, it kind of loses its scalability. That's why I call it a problem with scalability. The other thing is that uh, first I'll show the positive things in here. So um, you see on the top that you have different options. So basically you can look for a page. Um, this is my book, that's where I, what I'm using. And it uh, should uh, appear, and you can also go and like look for the pages in this way. It's pretty much a feel of PDF file. You can also look for pages from downstairs here, uh, kind of go to different ones. Okay, uh, also you can take notes, okay. Okay, just and also you can see the all the, your notes on the side. So that's another option that is nice. Um, you can also move from one book to another uh, easily. Um, and also, if you want to uh, highlight things, it's kind of this uh, a little bit not very the best, but you can highlight, you can annotate it, give it a name, and also you can share it. Okay, so send it somewhere. Okay, so uh, and the ruler, people, I oh, I promised you this. 
okay? The thing is, um, pay attention that how small is the font size. So let's say I, you know, I don't like that font size so much. <laughs> I won't tell you my age, but uh, you know, it's not. So I say, okay, let me go uh, larger. You see that I lose the upper options. That's why I'm saying it's not very scalable. And once I want to move or I cannot move, it immediately needs to, so I cannot enlarge it and take notes. I need to go back. So that's kind of a little bit uh, uncomfortable. Actually, personally, I don't like to use this, um, this app, and I actually don't use a uh, course mark. Some students like it. I think maybe the version of the phone, uh, of the uh, uh, laptop is better. I think they, they, are, uh, they have a little bit better ways to operate it, but for the, for the tablet, they are not there yet. The next one I want to talk about is Inkling. Inkling is a startup. Why did I bring Inkling and I have interest in Inkling? For several reasons. One is that if you all remember at the beginning of the semester actually, uh, Apple uh, announced that they are getting into the e-textbook uh, uh, environment and market. And they are actually using a very similar concept like Inkling. So Inkling was before that. I'm, I'm really surprised that they, didn't, they actually didn't buy Inkling, <laughs> purchase them. But uh, what is the idea here? You purchase the book. So it's not a rental model. The second thing is um, you can actually purchase per chapter. So there are two things that are good about that. One is that uh, if the professor doesn't use all the chapters, students may uh, buy only the chapters that the professor uses. The second thing is that if you students don't want to pay upfront everything, so they pay per chapter, so it's easier for them to to purchase the textbook. Um, the only thing is the chapters are not very cheap. So if you think about uh, t even 10 chapters, you are ending up with 130 bucks, which is, you know, a regular book can cost uh, that amount of money. Um, but uh, again, you own it. So that's another thing. It's very user friendly. It was built, the textbooks are built for the iPad. Many times that's a good thing because then they utilize all the technology of that mobile device and they build it uh, from scratch. It's not like put on top of, you know, like, like taking a web page and moving it to a mobile, which usually doesn't work very well. Um, they also added recently a very good um, social media or social media options that you can share notes you can get, receive, and uh, share notes from each other, and also go and connect on Facebook. And also, um, as I said, you have a free app, iPad app. Uh, you can highlight, you can add notes, and also you can take quizzes and get feedback. I'll show you a short video that shows how, um, for the business, uh, business books how they do that. So that's very nice. Um, uh, the weaknesses are, as I said, no uh, rent option, so you bought the book and you are with the book, you stay with the book, you cannot sell it or anything. Um, many times, because it's very media rich, that's the idea of it, to make it more interactive, um, takes a long time to download. If you have videos, you have audios, you have different three-dimensional um, um, applications, that's, that's very, um, very costly for your iPad. Another thing is that if you uh, own the book and it has uh, a lot of media, rich media, it takes a lot of space. So you need an iPad that has a lot of space and then you cannot get rid of it because you, you are stuck with that book because you bought it and you don't have that space that you can use for something else if you want to. Um, because it's a startup, it has only 100 um, uh, titles right now, but more and more um, publishers are adding their uh, books. I experimented with one of uh, principles of marketing that they offer, and I, they gave me a limited time. I cannot show it now because they uh, closed the time of my uh, sampling of the textbook, but I'll show you two very short videos just to give you a sense what it is and how it looks. So one of this a short videos is about the um, the features, including the uh, quizzes.
business schools everywhere are looking for opportunities to innovate with technology. And whether you're giving one of these to every student who comes to school or they're bringing it to class themselves, the iPad is going to be an incredibly important part of the learning process. That's why we partnered with Pearson to build some of the most popular MBA content from the ground up for iPad. It goes way beyond the PDF of a textbook on a screen. It's interactive and it's engaging. Let me show you what's different about Inkling content for iPad. Every Inkling title includes interactive assessments so a student can see if they know what they're supposed to know. What's more, when they get something wrong, it tells them why they were wrong so they can learn from their mistakes. Many business titles include a lot of charts and graphs, and they're all beautiful and high resolution inside Inkling. Vocabulary is an important part of studying, and every Inkling title includes pop tips that give a definition of a term the minute you tap it. Inkling brings business content to life. Try it for yourself. Download the Inkling application and grab a free chapter of anything that we offer. And for broader access to sample content, contact us. We think you and your students are going to love what they see. Okay, this is one. And again, as I said, I think it's important to know what's going on in this with this app because I think others will follow. They are new to this concept. Um, this is uh, the social aspect of the inkling. I just also a one minute uh, video. There are innate things that everyone has to do, like eating and sleeping. But there's this other innate characteristic that humans have that very few other species have, which is curiosity. What if we were able to reinvent the notion of Facebook from the ground up? You know, what would we do differently? Well, we bring together text and video and 3D objects, all of these different ways of learning under one roof, and make it really easy to use all together. I mean, textbooks don't have to be text, they don't have to be books. So we had to think about every single aspect of what we were doing from scratch. You know, if you were just to take away the spine of the book and think about pages like they were independent pieces, and you could shuffle them, and you could have this ability to explore the content freely, and just touch and swipe and pinch and zoom and explore whatever's in front of you. Just imagine a case where you simply want to answer a question, and when you add a note or a highlight and you say, what is this? I don't get it. And your friend sees it, and maybe she writes you a note, or she comes over and helps you on the spot. That's the magic of the whole thing. To have your entire social network turned into a learning network, and have all those people at your disposal to help you, and, and all you had to do was tap your finger. That's the sort of thing that really changes the way people learn. Okay, so actually I think the social aspect will grow in terms of e-textbooks, and I think that's why this kind of e-textbook will become more and more popular. So I don't know we'll, if we have other models for that, but, but that's kind of some, uh, that the, actually the books will be uh, built to the, uh, in five minutes, I'm almost done. Almost done. Okay, I'm moving on. So anyway, um, you, can, you can see YouTube and everything. Uh, they have very nice uh, videos, so you can look into that if that's interesting to you. Uh, especially medical, uh, nursing, and the, all those probably have some things interesting there. Um, the next one I want to talk quickly about is the McGraw-Hill's e-textbook. Um, this is something that comes uh, many times as a bundle with Connect. I use Connect, it's a platform for uh, assignments, quizzes, and, and exams that has much more possibilities than the Blackboard. Uh, the students are buying them usually with a textbook, um, and they can buy it with an e-textbook. As you see, uh, it still costs 80 bucks, so it's not very cheap. You get the platform and the e-textbook. It's also a rental model which also has a pl pluses and minuses. One, it, it get, goes away. The other one is you cannot keep it if you have notes and you want to keep it. It's a web-based, so it doesn't have an app. That's a, a downside to it, but it's interactive, which means I can find concepts, I can uh, find, if I'm looking for a concept, I see it everywhere I want to see in that textbook. Uh, very easy if you are studying for quizzes or, or things like that. Um, and it's word based, as I said. You also can easily copy and paste if you are preparing notes to for your class for your exam. Easily to move uh, content from the book to your note word document, for example. 
Um, and also, very nice uh, feature I'll show you on the iPad, hopefully, if I have time, is to hover above the concepts and then it opens the definition. So there are many nice things and there are very, some limitations. Let me open quickly my account uh, of, um, and I think it's here, I hope it will not lock me out. Anyway, this is how it looks. So basically, it's in my connect. Um, I have home is my, uh, I won't touch it because it may lock me out, so I don't want to go in again. But um, home is uh, what my classes, and here is the library where I find my e-book. If you, if you are a student and you purchase it, you have it the same way, so you can easily go in. Uh, you can see that basically I can search here. Um, if I write a term that um, we use, you can easily find all the places that the book has um, mentions that, which is nice. I think it's very nice. Uh, also, if you hover here, you can find the definition. Um, and again, if you work in your laptop, easy, uh, you see it doesn't go away. So it's not very, very, um, it has its uh, uh, problems a little bit, but, but again, it's very easy to use. What I like about it also, if you have some concept, uh, oops, that's what I said, it will probably lock me out. Um, give me, <laughs> Um, give me a second. That's another problem. It's web-based, so every time you use it, you need to log in. Um, also, you cannot use it, of course, offline. Yes. So basically, what I like about it, and I started to use it, um, you see that you can go also to certain chapters, and you see that it uh, goes according to the chapters of the textbook, of the physical book. So that's also a good, if you have both, sorry. Um, but uh, what I like about it, that if you have a one topic, you go all the way and everything is in one place. So you don't need to go through pages. It's all you scroll down. I use this a lot. And um, I, uh, I say to students this, if students are not comfortable, uh, another thing is you can print. If you see here, you can print some of the pages if you want to bring them to class. Um, I, uh, I actually uh, put in the, in the bookstore a bundle of um, loose leaf and e-textbook with the connect. And it's usually about how much? One thirty. One thirty dollars. And I tell students if you are comfortable, if you are wor working on a practice quiz or doing some things at home, and you want quickly to find the uh, the information, you can use the e-textbook. If you are you want to you know highlight or work with with the more tangible thing, you have the loose leaf, so you can have uh, from both worlds. Enjoy the both worlds and. Um, uh, I suggest them to do that bundle. But if you, if some some students feel very comfortable with an e-textbook, I suggest them only to buy connect with the e-textbook. I'm done. Okay. So um, I think that's it uh, for me, and I will invite now um, Soko uh, to continue. And Scott. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'd like to start first with an overview of the University Bookstore's digital platform, which is Cafe Scribe. And then Sokol will show a demonstration of some of its features. Uh, first, uh, what is Cafe Scribe? Uh, Cafe Scribe is a company that was founded in 2004 and acquired by Follett, the University Bookstore's parent company, in 2007. Uh, Follett selected Cafe Scribe because it provided a high quality digital textbook uh, uh, many unique features, uh, plus the, uh, the opportunity to customize text. Students can highlight and, uh, and select different versions of highlighting so that they can summarize their notes and highlightings into one convenient place. And it has ease of use for both faculty and students. The Cafe Scribe platform has uh, two distinct parts. Uh, first is the website, cafescribe.com. This is where users can establish a profile and they can purchase their textbooks. Um, they can purchase online as well as in the bookstore. And if they purchased them in the store, they would go to the website to then access their, their library and their, their digital text. The e-reader, the other part, is the Cafe Scribe Reader, which is a free web-based e-reader where students can interact with the text. This has the, uh, the features such as highlighting and take notes, 
Uh, they could search, sort, and summarize notes with a snap summary. That's the place that accumulates all of the information that they've, uh, that they've gathered throughout the semester. And they can also copy and print a portion of the text within the digital rights management. As Bella mentioned, there are limits to, to printing. It's generally 30% we find within our, within our textbook uh, title selection of the digital rights management. And it does, the digital versions do follow the exact pagination as a printed textbook, so which is helpful for a book that is adopted by an instructor, that everyone's on the same page with the printed version as well as the e-text version if some are using one version versus the other. And it also off, um, offers the ability to collaborate with peers and professors within the textbook itself. Uh, there's the option to share notes, as uh, Bella mentioned, with the interactive kind of uh, Facebook aspect of the program to form a community uh, within the class to share ideas or collaborate, ask questions, and as a give and take program uh, within the, within the, uh, the platform itself. Uh, some of the features of the platform overall, uh, we collaborate with 50 publishing partners and we're currently at over 25,000 titles nationally. Um, locally in our store, we expect to be at about 20% uh, about of our assortment for the fall semester, which, which put us about 300 to possibly 350 titles uh, for, the, for the fall semester. That would include certainly many of core titles, uh, books that are primary from major publishers, and would generally be uh, a book that is a primary text for a class, one book for a such an anthropology class that has just a, uh, a core textbook, um, history classes or English classes, the, the uh, humanities may not be as, as inclusive with the digital books, but our anthropology, psychology, economics books, we're finding those are becoming digitally available uh, quicker. And our program offers a try now and buy later, which is a three-day trial period. Um, we have access to all the features. And uh, you can take it for a test drive and see if you like it, and then buy from there. And anything that you've uh, test, tested during that period would become available as you continue with the, with the program. Uh, we're finding that the, the pricing for the textbooks, for if you purchase a digital book, is 40 to 60% less than a new textbook. And we also have the option to, uh, to rent for an 180-day subscription period. So we have the uh, option for both of those, um, both of those features. And it is um, available, it's a device agnostic, it's independent of any device. It can be used on PCs or tablets um, and mobile devices as well. Uh, any device that has access to the internet um, can, can access Cafe Scribe and, and be able to use all the features. And then it is also uh, available for download. Um, it can be downloaded onto three computers. Uh, for a 10-day period where it can be used offline. If you do not have access to internet, if you're traveling, if you're on the road, you want to have the, the book available, um, you could use it with just about all of its features for 10 days, and then once you connect to the internet again, you would sync up your any notes that you've taken, and then you can renew your offline period as well for 10 days. Okay, I think with that, so I'd like to uh, okay, I'm gonna show some of the features. Give you a quick tour of Cafe Scribe. Um, this is the main homepage where students can uh, pretty much try now buy later a title, or they can purchase or rent their digital contact from this website. Uh, here you can also search and see what books are available. Uh, books that are available via our bo books that are available via our bookstore. They're already um, show on our they already show on our shelf tag. So students uh, are already looking at that option if they want to go with digital and uh, save some money. Save some money. Here uh, you can just put the subject up a calculus search. And they will give you all the calculus title, uh, all the titles that have calculus in their uh, title for you to. Um, Excuse me, uh, volumes work uh, In the beginning, uh, how did you get this Cafe Scribe? Cafescribe.com, that's the website, but students can also access it via our website, the bookstore website. All right, so just, just tell me, is it do WP Connect or is it do. You can, if you go to, if you go under WP Connect and then you go to the bookstore's website, which is under the self uh, service or student services, um, you can get that way or you can just type www.cafescribe.com. And as, as a professor, do you, do you need an account or do you search the same way? As a professor, you do need to set up an account, but you do get a free digital copy. Oh, yeah, just contact the bookstore. Sorry. That's okay. Just let me know, and uh, we, we can get that for you. Okay. 
And I'm just gonna go, uh, you just click the Cafe Scribe Reader. And this will give you access to the reader online and offline, obviously. You would create an account. Uh, when you create the account, it's pretty general information. And obviously here by the school, you would type your institution, which would be William Patterson University. Why is that important is because you can share notes uh, with the community here at the university. And also faculty can insert notes within the textbooks, links, anything that they want to make available to the students. And that can be made available as a public note, which I will show you in a second. So let me just log in. And here's my bookshelf. Um, I have one book that is active that I've purchased, The Astronomy. Then I have two other books that I uh, used the Try Now Buy Later feature. I did not purchase them. So obviously the trial expired after three days. A quick look of this main page. Um, it shows you last viewed page right here. Uh, you can go directly to your bookmarks. You can go to your notes that you've taken. Um, and also the Snap Summary, which is one of uh, uh, neat features of this program. Uh, the Snap Summary, pretty much condenses or compiles all your notes and all your highlighting that you've done throughout the semester in this textbook. It's helpful if you're using it to review your uh, for your quizzes, your exams, um, and I'll show that in a second how, to, how it looks like. Also, it's the book info, as you heard earlier about the digital uh, DRM, the digital rights management that the publishers offer. A lot of publishers offer about 30% of printing, 30% uh, of copy and paste. Um, and here it shows you how much printing you have left and how much copying and paste you have left. So you know as you're progressing in your classroom, uh, you know, how much of those uh, features you have left. I'm going to go inside the textbook. And we just chose this astronomy textbook. Obviously here on the left panel, you can jump anywhere within any chapter. As Scott mentioned, pagination is the same, so you can have students using the regular uh, uh, version book, a hard copy, and you can have students using the Cafe Scribe version, the pagination will stay the same. And it's right here in the bottom, you can uh, either click next, or you can pretty much just in, put a page number and go there, okay? Um, in the bottom, uh, we have different zoom in options, zoom in or zoom out, you can make to fit with and uh, read the textbook, or you can have a two page layout, um, okay. Um, on the side over here, we do have the search feature. That's a very neat feature to use um, if you're searching for a keyword or a, a definition. In this case, I'm just going to search for Mars. And it gives you all the places, all the pages where Mars is being used within the textbook. You can also sort it out by instances, which will give you the most uh, occurrences to the least occurrences. And obviously you can just click anywhere in there and that will take you to the page and show you everything regarding uh, the keyword that you are searching for. Okay, I'm gonna clear that out. Um, the other neat feature that I wanted to show you is the snap summary, okay? Um, this pretty much shows all the highlighting and all the notes that I've taken so far. Um, you can print this out, you can download it on your computer. Um, you can click anywhere here and like a, for example this one, the quiz, and it will take you to that page. And uh, it shows quiz, this will be in the next week's quiz. quiz. So I've inserted a note, a note for this highlighting over here. You can edit this and you can make it public by just clicking here if you'd like and then you click save. And what that will do is everybody, everyone in the university community will see your public note that you've made, okay? Um, and I just wanna show you how that looks like. You go to notes and these are my notes right here. I have six notes and also you have the community notes. And here your professor could include other additional information, like I said, links, uh, whatever additional information, please go to the library, get this book, because it provides a supplement. Um, and then you would click in one of those. It takes you to that page and it shows you who made that, uh, who was either the professor or, or just another student. Uh, again, you don't see this all the time. You only see it when you want to see it. So it doesn't get confusing, because a lot of students might be like, well, I don't want to see what everybody else wrote about it. 
So I think that's very, uh, very nice feature. Um, another nice feature that we have here, uh, the highlighting, it's by colors. You can certainly add more, add more and name them however you want to name them. Uh, I'm going to just do one real quick. Uh, just choose a yellow color and just put final project. So this way, if I use that color, I'll know that all the highlighting for that, I'm going to use it for my final project. Okay. Um, obviously, you have the book, the bookmarks. I have a couple of bookmarks right here that you can insert, and obviously, they will take you wherever you need to uh, be there. Um, and the notes, you can search for notes, so that's another neat feature. Okay. And then for the snap summary, again, like I said, um, just one second here. You can kind of. Um, filter what you're looking for within your notes, okay? So I don't want the uh, quiz exam notes. So if you uncheck that, that will minimize your snap summary what you're looking for. So it makes it a lot more convenient to get that information right away so you don't have all this information there trying to sort through it. Um, the other option right here, again, you can uh, download this offline as Scott mentioned. So if you're uh, worried about your internet connection, you can certainly do so. You have access to it for 10 days. Um, and again, all you have to do is just after the 10 days, you have to just log in once to your online reader and that will sync up everything offline and online and you have another 10 days and another 10 days. And if you purchase the books, you can do that all the time. If you are renting it, you have 10, pretty much 10 days offline up to your 180 days, okay? Um, these are pretty much some of the features. Um, again, we, the, the good thing about this program is that we deal with different publishers and faculty, if, uh, and faculty can also uh, request a book. A book might not be available in our Cafe Scribe digital platform. All you have to do is contact the bookstore and we'll try to get it to you as soon as possible. As a faculty, you are entitled to a free digital copy or a desk copy. Again, contact the bookstore. If you're interested, we'll, we'll get you uh, a, that digital copy and you can come to our, our offices. We'll come and visit you and give you a tour and show you around, okay? And the last thing that I wanted to mention is the Connect Your Thoughts website. Okay. Well, This is pretty much uh, every student that has purchased a digital option, obviously to save money, uh, we direct them to this website. It shows you step by step on a YouTube video how to use the reader, how to use the mobile app, and how to use the offline feature. So it's a really neat place to kind of go and get familiar with it and see if you like it. Okay. And now opening to questions. I'm not going near the microphone. <laughs> I just want to thank all of our presenters. I'd like to ask the presenters and Dr. Taka to come to the front because you may have specific questions that you want to address to a specific presenter. Can I start with your question? Sure. And for pointing out something that I think came up when we were discussing this, um, that it's the kind of thing that I never would have thought to ask or I wouldn't have thought was an issue. So um, maybe Scott or one of the people could talk about uh, what you had mentioned regarding financial aid. I hate to sully this with a discussion of money, but uh, it, it's something that's, I think, on all of our minds. Sure. Like I said, yes, I never would have thought to ask about it. But it's a nice feature that our, our digital platform is one of our options. It's available through the bookstore and it can be purchased with any funds that students have available. So certainly financial aid um, can be used to purchase within the store and uh, there's no restrictions as far as you know, how, how, how it can be purchased and the usage for it. So that's why we always encourage faculty to place the order with the store. Um, if they have other preferences, they can certainly make it known as to where items are available, but we want to get the students on campus who have uh, monies that are only available here that the option to purchase their books at, at our source. So that's a good point. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. 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 Um, last two semesters I've been teaching an online, uh, I've been teaching my course, but online, and I've become more and more interested in uh, the electronic uh, 
media. Um, I'm using uh, maybe two or three different sources, and next semester I'm going to be using maybe five or six different sources as I change the syllabus to better reflect the UCC requirement. Um, so I'm, I'm bringing uh, together <coughs> sources from maybe six or seven different textbooks, including one that I contributed to. Um, I have got an email from, I think it's Pearson or Prentice, about Course Smart and uh, help us figure out you build your uh, own textbook. And I, I just have never had time to really explore it. But uh, is there one of these uh, options that you talked about that brings these various uh, publishers together? Do you have to sort of hunt and uh, find which publishers participate with which? Uh, well, through our, through our program, so if you can connect your thoughts, you can search by subject or by category so you can see what the different, different offerings are for your, your discipline. I'm sorry. It, uh, within, our, within our program, um, we offer custom publishing for, for materials that you, are, you have authored, not through that are copyrighted materials. So we, we offer Cafe Scribe is available for that purpose, that if you have materials that, that you own, um, you can make them available digital through Cafe Scribe. And they'll have all the features that are included within, within the platform. Um, but within Connect Your Thoughts or CafeScribe.com, you can search for what, what titles are available within your discipline. Um, so whatever you're teaching, you could search and, uh, and see what the options are um, for, your, for your curriculum for what you're trying to create. If, you, if you're doing online or hybrid, um, one real advantage to the eBooks is you can actually set up, like for example with Connect, um, you can set up practice quizzes which are, are directly taken from the publisher and use all of the resources. So I usually set up, I, you can give them as much time as they want to do it, you can give them as many attempts, you can give them as much feedback, um, you can integrate it directly into your Blackboard so that it's actually graded um, and you don't have to do the grading, Blackboard's doing it. Um, you can, t you can um, indicate when you want the results released to them. The other thing is, is I also set up practice quizzes. I only make it 10 questions. You can give them as many attempts or as little attempts as you want. And you can set up, Bella taught, taught me how to do it, you set up pools. Um, so let's say you want 10 questions. You want one to be on structure, one to be on function. You can set up like seven, seven questions for that, 10 for this. And each student that takes it will have a different selection from the pool. Yes, I do that. Yes. Um, but the question is more bringing I, these I think, resources together. I think if I understand, you want to create your own book from different chapters. Right. Um, from but, different publishers, yeah. different uh, publishers. Publishers, I don't know. Of course, But, uh, yeah. yeah, I know that uh, I did it for uh, McGraw-Hill. We were looking into a course that we wanted to put together different chapters from different textbooks. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you have that option, but it's within McGraw-Hill all the pool from all their books and articles that's a huge pool you can search and you can it's create uh, called create and what is nice about that they can give you a p uh, like you can create a pdf file like pdf book so it can be downloaded or it can be also a hard copy and you can get it for review and then decide if you want it to give to your students, so very, very flexible. And those are all McGraw-Hill titles. Again? But those are all McGraw-Hill exactly. titles. Exactly, exactly. I don't know if, uh, because they don't collaborate, I don't know if they want to collaborate. Well, yeah. <laughs> if, if, you, if you start pulling from different publishers, you're going to get into intellectual property yes. issues, so I suggest that you work with the librarians if you're going to develop a kind of course pack like that. I heard some other way you could do, maybe as many, maybe as, many as 60 pages, from a given uh, text or two or three chapters. I don't know what the allowable usage is. It, it, uh, it depends. You, you, you need to follow fair use guidelines. And, and like I said, it's good to, to work with the library to develop something. Now, what uh, Bella's using is all with, from McGraw-Hill, and they've allowed you to go into all their different books, creating a pool that way. Um, they, there are no intellectual property issues with something like that. I teach uh, seminars and uh, on special topic courses, so 
here is a sort of a typical situation. I have a course in which I want to, I have five books, which are topical books, they're not textbooks. Uh, and I want the different students, uh, students to choose one to do a, a very long kind of research book review. What is my best bet? I mean, what can I can I access these and put them on the blackboard? I mean, what what's the way to do this? Uh, I mean, I think that's an ideal situation for the kinds of ebook monographs that the library purchases. Anything that's an upper division course or a graduate course of that type where you wouldn't necessarily want um, to, to compel the students to have to buy old books, especially if they're only going to use a few of them or parts of them. Uh, that's a situation where maybe, I, I, I didn't mention this during my presentation, but of course the library, uh, as a matter of routine policy, takes uh, orders of books from faculty. And even though it may not always occur to a faculty member to inquire as to whether a title that they want is available in electronic format, you, you can certainly do that, or your liaison in the library can respond to you, um, particularly if you're indicating what you intend to use it for, whether you would prefer it to be in an electronic format. Because if, if, if that is the case, or if that's an option, uh, then I think it's most suitable to that purpose. Does that, does that answer your question, Bob? <laughs> okay. Just a quick financial question: Is uh, is Cafe Scribe redundant if our students are buying an electronic book from the publisher? Are they automatically doing it through Cafe Scribe, or do they have? It would be the same material. I think it would be a choice between one or the other. Cafe Scribe is the textbook itself um, that has the features that are provided within the program, but it wouldn't be materials that are outside of what provided by the publisher. Okay. Okay. You, you can't say just, scribe is like the online book store. It's like, yeah. yeah. It's just, but it's just the book, I think, is what you're trying to classify, as opposed to Connect, which has quizzes and extra. It's a platform oh, with well. Ethan. So it's nice. really, if I want to use anything other than the book, like their testing features, I need to go through the publisher. Yeah, or you, if you use the Blackboard and they give you, you know, into the oh, Blackboard. blackboard yeah. So you can ask, you work with the cafe scribe and then you work with the Blackboard separate. Uh, and like is there a separate fee for registering for cafe scribe? Mm -hmm. no, no. no, it's just create, creating an account to have access to the reader, that, that's a free reader, and then it's just purchase of the textbook itself to, to use within the reader. And as a faculty, you are entitled to a free desk copy, okay. digital copy. Yeah. And I just want to mention that both, Black, uh, that both cafe scribe and uh, McGraw-Hills Connect are available, they're already directly available in Blackboard. Is it fine? Yeah, they're already available in Cafe Blackboard. And, and, and the Broad Hill Connect, yeah. Follow up with my last question. If I no. get the book from eBooks, I just, my students can use it as if it were on reserve so they don't have to buy the book? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, say I mean, look, the, the, we, we, we've, we've spoken about this as well. Uh, I, I hope that one of the things that was made clear in this presentation, I think it's been, and I think the fellow made that very clear, there is a sector of the uh, book publishing world that is in the business of producing textbooks. So in other words, they are, they are publishing books that are to be used as textbooks, and everybody recognizes the textbook when they see it, not just, not just the public. Then there are books that faculty members use as required texts, right. but which are not themselves textbooks. That's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, that happens all the time. Um, so if, if you know that a book is available as an electronic book in, in the library, um, yes, you, you can, I, I would make an inquiry first as to whether or not it has a simultaneous user license. There the issue is not, is, then is not so much money because the book has already been paid for. <laughs> if we have the book in our collection, we've either purchased it or we're, or we're licensing it through a subscription. It's so it's not, yeah, so it's, it's, it's accessible, you, you can use it. But if it is, but if it is a case where it's a, it's a one user license, then I think in fairness, it should simply be disclosed to the class. <laughs> if, you know, if people think that they're all going to look at it, um, at the same time, because that won't be the case. But uh, otherwise, yeah, it could be it can be used that way. And to clarify, the very few one user that we have in the library through what Richard showed, uh, if I'm reading it, 
and you try to access to it, it says you're going to have to wait. When I close down and stop reading it, it becomes available to the next person. Um, so yeah, so if everyone 20 minutes before the class <laughs> tried to read it, it's not going to work. Um, but it's if, a teachable moment. Yeah, it, but um, Bella's marketing textbooks, yeah. we cannot buy through yeah. the platform that we use because they're not going to provide access to them that way. Um, right here. These, I guess, platforms, are they accessible for students that are um, blind or have vision impairments? Will it work with like a JAWS? Um, well, if I could speak to that for, uh, for eBury in particular, which is the majority of our, of our books in the library uh, that are electronic format, the software that they do provide uh, includes two features which will be of uh, use to students with disabilities. If they have a visual disability that's not full blindness and they just need magnification, you, you can magni magnify the text. So that's a benefit. And for those who need uh, text-to-speech, it's also available through that software. And we've tested it. It's actually very good. It's just less mechanical than I've heard from other sorts of text-to-speech devices. And Cafe Scrap has that feature also the bookstore platform. To the library people, how does a faculty member or student know that the book they're looking at is a one-user versus a multi-user license? Uh, uh, the easiest way would be to ask the librarian. <laughs> we can check. Uh, although my understanding is the single user, and Richard may know this better, uh, the download options are more limited. But I think you'd, you'd have to know what they are anyway to know that you're missing some of them. So the easiest way, especially if you're considering it for a class um, is either to test it out, have the person at the computer next to you try to view it, or just contact your liaison, and we can look at um, our purchasing records and find out how we uh, how we purchased it. I do have one one last question. Or the, there are notes. I believe from, there's a note in the, in the record we can't remember. From a librarian. Okay. <laughs> one last question. You're on. We, we never yeah, talked to each other. The response to that, that things that are in academic are unlimited user, unlimited time, so everybody can get on at the same time as the staff. But there's a little place in the record that will tell you if it's single user or multi-user. But the public wouldn't be looking for that, which is why they say just ask somebody. Yeah. So if you have more questions uh, or comments, uh, send the emails to either Sandy or me after we fix the microphone. We'll send them to uh, our appropriate panelists. Thank you all for coming.